everyone and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee and or occasionally wine and talking about anything and everything. We may use explicit language and will almost certainly drop F-bombs, but none of that is the point or the drive of the content, so consider us PG-13. There will be rants and raves and occasional readings. There will be conflicting creative advice driven by at least three utterly disparate points of view. Your hosts today are John Schmidt and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 15, everything about writing good scripts. All right, that may be a little ambitious for today's half-hour podcast, but we are deeply honored to have Carol Wolf with us today. If I may read her bio, Carol Wolf is an award-winning playwright and drama instructor. She earned a degree in history at Mills College and an MFA in drama playwriting at Rutgers University. Her plays have seen 30 productions on five continents. She's also written scripts for video games and produced two movies. Welcome, Carol. We are not worthy. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I would say five continents. Are we talking Antarctica? Because that would be awesome. An- Antarctica is not the one. Is the one that's left. So I know someone who knows someone who works on the ship that takes the scientists to. And I've asked him, asked him to ask him if he would read one of my plays, Standing Offshore from Antarctica, and would that count? Oh my God! So, I would totally. Ca- I would vote for that. I, yeah, that counts. <laughs> so Antarctica is still left. Well, but, North oh. America, South America. Asia, Europe, Australia. Yes. What am I missing? Nothing. Okay. Beautiful. Well, in particular, this was exciting. John said he knew you, and I think that was perfectly awesome. We have talked about writing a story a lot, which takes... A a story can take place entirely in a person's head or a narrative. Uh, Like, for instance, we know Dorothy Parker wrote a thing about almost an ode to a telephone, the stupid, horrible, non-ringing thing, which Mm -hmm. didn't ring. And it's all about this moment of anxiety in her head. But that's not really visual. You really need to write a visual piece. So let's call a visual piece a play or a TV show or a movie. Um, It's different, isn't it? Those are completely different mediums. Yes. Um, But they are more visual, all of them, than what I can get in a short story, for instance. The the theater is that is that three dimensional space in which you which you fill with energy units, which are your actors, and it works best if first of all they're using all of the three dimensional space, and secondly, well, you have to have a tension level. You put a tension level into the story so that the actors are responding to the tension level. When you when you have tension, it shows on your body. You know you have a tension level when their bodies respond to it. Right. And then you use that tension as a, like a tennis game, where they whack things at each other and make each other respond, so that every line of dialogue is like a weapon that they use against each other to affect that tension. There, that's a precise. That's a, that's precise. a precise. And I, I am well corrected in this. I, I read your book. I was going to say, this woman wrote a book on it, which we will pimp out in the liner notes, on how to write a play. And it had a lot of pieces in that, for instance, it's very hard to flood your entire stage. I liked that. And please don't set your sets on fire. That will be not according to fire code. And Well, you know, practical aspects of what works in the theater. Um, I, I started, uh, I, went to, I went to Rutgers to get a, a degree in drama. I'd already written uh, 14 plays by the time I got there, mostly. 14, wow. Um, two of them had been produced. I think, Mm -hmm. and I I got to Rutgers and walked into this vacuum, which I didn't understand. I thought that the head of the playwriting department knew everything about playwriting. And the fact is she knew two things. She knew it has to work in the theater, which is absolute baseline. If it doesn't work on the stage. And the other thing she knew was if the king died and the queen died is not as dramatic as the king died because the queen died. Those were her two things. So I was... Uh, writing up a storm, usually you go to Rutgers and you bring the play that you that got you in and you rewrite that for a year and then you give it up and then you write another one and in the p- between that you write a one act and that's all you write while you're there. I wrote 17 plays while I was there and 66 drafts of nine of them. Wow. So, 66? Yes, I have the box. I can still count them. Oh my so God. This is not an exaggeration. 66 drafts of nine of them. So I was writing all the time um, and I would go Oh, okay, it has to work in the theater. So what it means is you're controlling the, 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 um, the attention of the audience. 
So in order to control the attention of the audience, you do this and this. Okay, does that work? You put it in your script, and then you try it, and it works. The thing is, how do you know if it works? If someone else uses it in their, in their script, then it works. If I use it in my script, I'm just making it up. But if I can teach it to someone else and it works in their script, then it is a solid technique of playwriting. So what I found almost immediately was that in order to go on learning, I had to teach. So as soon as I got out of records, I was always soliciting opportunities to teach. Students as lab rats is what I'm hearing, so... Kind yeah. yeah, well, yes, yeah. And, um, but that's why, that's why teaching has always been a, a, a part of my, of my learning how to be a playwright, because that's my reality check yeah. on whether what mm -hmm. I'm doing is, in, is a, you know, made up or is actual mechanical fact. And the fact is that playwriting is very mechanical once you get down to it, um, which doesn't change the creativity. It's just the tool whereby you can use your so the story that's making your brain explode and putting it into a form whereby you seize the audience's attention and hold it for two hours. Formula. No, because formula means this first, then this, then this. Te a no, series no. of techniques is, is like, I need this here, and I need that there, and I need this there, and oh, what about this? And if I break these two up, how does that work? Like I, that. I was actually struck while reading to similarities, and before you reject this entirely out of hand, between somebody else who was writing the two to 10,000 book, I was saying that it talked about every single scene needs a reason to exist. It has to give you information that advances the plot, and it has to have a real reaction. So in a certain way, it was using different language, but very similar to how you were talking I, about maintaining tension, unveiling the plot, and moving onward. Yeah, because what you're trying to do is satisfy the audience. Right. And if your scene begins, and then at the end of it, you haven't gone anywhere, or nothing has changed, then you're not, your audience isn't going to be satisfied. So yes, all right, in the sense of you begin it with something about to happen, something happens because of it, and at the end of the scene, you're somewhere else, Okay, that's formulaic. Yeah. You have to have those elements in order for it to be a good scene. I, I think a point here is that when you say formulaic, it's usually a formula of a plot. That's a connotation. Oh, I could maybe, yeah. That, yeah. I but suppose it's be become a bad may, word that way. Yes, yeah. um, I would like to point out that you have a second group of lab rats, and as one of them, I found your book fascinating, and I highly recommend it. Anyone who wants to act, her writing about characters within plays gives you as an actor, a very good way to relate to them. And so the fact that as a local theater actor, I read your book and it just made sense. Everything made sense. It all rang true. And it's the, you gave me more vocabulary for the things I was trying to do and also gave me attention points because I hadn't been focusing on the character's tension and their main motivation. And in light opera based on Gilbert and Sullivan, they've been done so many times, it's kind of automatic that you see that. But having your vocabulary and, and your book as inspiration actually made me conspicuously a better actor because I could walk in, determine those two things, and that informs all of the acting. Well, that's really cool. Thank you. I haven't had that kind of feedback from an actor before. Uh, really for cool. an actor who isn't a professional actor, your insight into the mechanics of playwriting is an insight into the mechanics of translating the play into the actor, into the actions. Well, that works because every technique in playwriting, I mean, um, you're, you aspire to not have to be there when your play goes up. It needs to work without you, without your hands on it. So the script has to be all the communication that you need with the actor. So the script has to make the actor go to the tension level that you want, say the line the way you want him to say him or her to say it, and um, have, well, you, you still leave what my, one of my mentors used to call imaginary space, mm -hmm. which is the place where they explode into their acting magic, mm -hmm. which is why one works for actors in the first place, because, you, because they make that magic happen. But you give them the basis from which to jump off. And the direction and the level of energy to jump, which really... There's a difference between a swan dive, a belly flop, and a leap into the skies. Yeah, and if I can just drag Shakespeare into this conversation. Oh, drag, drag. If you flip open a, 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 a Shakespeare play and put your finger on the line and read the line, you can tell how far he, the character is standing from the character he's speaking to. Because you can be that specific. You can build that into the line. You can build the blocking into the line. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, the, the playwright, a competent playwright 
will, even if they're not there, have that kind of control over the directive. I can see that. I also liked that you had a don't write too much direction into it, which now, because I'm writing a screenplay, I'm having to go back and say, I don't have to put laughing here. It, it'll just happen or it won't happen. Or well, no, you're doing a do. screenplay. Yeah. Because the, the, in a play, you are giving direction to the actor. Right. The actor is allowed to take a pen, uh, to take a faulty, and go through your stage directions and mark them out. Right. Um, because giving stage directions to the actor is kind of crossing the line. Right. But in a screenplay, you're not talking to the actor, you're talking to the director. Right. And in the, in the screenplay, you need to you need to hand walk the director through how your play works. So no, you should put laughing in, okay. and you should put okay. all those things because you're talking. She didn't have to take that's, them back that's, in. <laughs> that's why the, the stage directions in a screenplay go from the left margin to the right margin, because right. they're the most important thing. Well, the dialogue is in the middle because it's not that important. Whereas st uh, stage directions in a play are over to the side and oh, I noticed because, it. Yeah, okay. So that they're not, and it's the lines of the actor that go from the back and forth across the page, because that's what's important in a play. But in a screenplay, you are you are writing for the eye of the camera, for the inexorable eye of the camera, and you have to walk the camera's eye through. What are you seeing? What's happening now? What's seeing? And it's not the same as writing for actors. I like it. So I'm going to change slightly because I can't hold it anymore. You have a play up currently. Unfortunately, it will end by the time we go. You have movies. Uh, you have you have video games as well. Are you? I do, but they're you know they're old video games. They're, okay, they're okay. Not, video games know. of the past. Let us talk then of the near future. I didn't have enough time to catch your current production. What have you got coming up in the next three months? Well, what's well, I'm at the end of a run that I've never seen before in my history. I had a, a book released in March, uh, um, The Book of Lost Days, my science fiction book. And then I, oh, I finished a movie in March, too. I finished Letters to My Grandchildren, a documentary feature, which is now, has just been accepted to its second film festival. It's accepted oh, to the Great Lakes International Film Festival. It's also accepted to the Miami Independent Film Festival. So that's two. Um, and then I had... My play, The Thousandth Night, got translated into French, and this summer played at the Avignon Theatre Festival in French, and that was pretty cool. We got to go and see it. The Thousandth Night, is this Scheherazade? Or? It was Monsieur Scheherazade. Ha! Awesome. Um, oh. But then I got my real title back, um, uh, The Thousandth Night, and then that is now Le Million Nuit en Français. And uh, so that played there. I, I feel so close to you. I have a short story called One Arabian Day from cool. the point of view of Jafar that just came, you know, got published. Very Similarly, cool. right, there's so much you can do with Jafar's, a storyteller. The, 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 the vizier, the what if he's a, vizier. What if he's a good guy? Well, he's sometimes good and he's yeah, sometimes evil, exactly. sometimes hapless. I went and looked up the, the historical Jafar. Did you? Yeah, there is one. J Jafar al Bernaki was, was the pace it was based on. It was fascinating. Wow. I love history. That is cool. I do too. You have a history uh, bachelor's, don't you? Yeah, I have a, I have a B in, in nice, history. Nice. But in terms of the characters being driven, I, I like the way you talked about that in terms of, you know, you wait, have to... Wait, <laughs> wait. Wait, wait. Cymbeline. Tell me about Cymbeline. Okay, oh. so then uh, the ter the um, Dr. Rowan, the Demon in Love went up as soon as I got back from... And that ended uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And then the Thousandth Night, meanwhile, the Thousandth Night, the English version, has been going across North America to the Fringe Festivals, and it is finishing, it began in Hollywood in June, and is in finishing at the San Francisco Fringe Festival this weekend, which will be last Saturday when this is aired. Exactly. So, um, so that's awesome. And then in November... You, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm going to pimp out a link to that via our Twitter account, so you guys will get there and on Facebook before this is even released, so we'll... Cool. Just in case anybody wants to go. Very cool. Um, the next thing is that the Pear Theater is doing a developmental reading of my new play, um, the, the Queen's Cookies, or Cymbeline Simplified, which has to do with my rocky relationship with the play Cymbeline, which uh, I will go into another time. And that's in November? That's November 15th, Friday, November 15th at 8 or 8.30 at the Pear Theater. In Mountain View. In Mountain View. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I was going to say, um, we talked about that. I wanted to, to uh, delve a little bit back into your idea of characters and cuts and when you, trust a, when you trust a director versus when you trust an actor versus cuts. Describe cuts. I mean, I read about it last night of a thing. So I, I was suddenly imagining a cut is what makes a, a driver for a character. Are they angry, you know, sweeping angrily versus what would happen if it was the Pirates of Penzance and Mabel wheeled out in a wheelchair? Well... 
think in terms of you put somebody on the stage. There he is standing on the stage, or her. She is standing on the stage. The character cut is a basic characterization that immediately characterizes them. So you can't say thoughtful. That's not a strong characterization. Remember, this has to read all the way to the back of the theater. But if you say um, crippled, then your actor will go, well, if you give that word crippled to your actor, your actor will make all kinds of large, interesting things, like Richard III was in, in Shakespeare. If you say angry and you tell them to walk around the stage, they're going to be stamping. If you say devious or you say cynical, cynical is harder because it's hard to show cynical. So but do you, do things you, that you can physically show the audience. Do you sketch a, that out in advance? Like, no, is that right. something you tell them at the beginning? Oh, the play? No, no, because remember, you're not there. Right. A good playwright is, does not have to be there. So what you do is you put it into the words. Okay. So if you write a character who's speaking angrily, they can't speak any other way. Okay. God damn it. So you say angrily. <laughs> no, no, you, you don't. Angrily. Because if you have to put it in the stage direction, it's not in the lines. Okay. What you do is you put it in lines. I'm angry. Stomp, stomp, stomp. No, I can't no, get, no, no. He's like, where is he? Where is he? Damn it. What is he coming back? I can't believe that he's done this again. As opposed to, oh, 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 Harry, please come home. Oh. Ah, right. That makes sense. Then so I misunderstood you, how you said cut. So excellent. A, a character cut is like a, I see it as, you know, you take one of those, those shapeless rocks and you take a gem cutting um, saw and you get this facet that is gem-like and absolutely unique and clear. And that is your first characterization. And every character you ever write has to have at least that much characterization, that they have one aspect that is absolutely clear and unique to them. Now, a better, a deeper playwriting, what you do is you take a second cut and a third and a fourth. And you can't take more than, say, nine, because after that what you're going to get is too many facets whereby they can't, be they can't be defined. But if you take a character like Hamlet and take him apart, what you'll find is about nine character cuts. I was actually sitting, funny you should say Hamlet, I was thinking of Claudius and trying to figure out how many cuts he had when you described it that way. Claudius at the opening is the benevolent king, you know. Yes, and he's also he secretly evil. Secretly evil. And, and lusty after the, obviously lusty and lustful, after the queen. Yes. And trying to stay in command over his son who ought to be the king. Uh, his yeah. stepson who ought to be the king. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was, it was interesting when I started taking apart those Yeah, but the best things. place to start is with the archetype, right? Archetypal characters automatically have character cuts. The king. Yeah, that makes sense. And then you give him another one, like... Maybe the king who's not good at it, or maybe the king, the king who's a tyrant, or the king who's afraid. Mm -hmm. And then you have two, and that's even better. Usur Usurper king. Usurper, Usurper. 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 Oh, that, that too is, a, is also a character type. So, Towers and Wells. So, um, let me give a shout out to uh, Kate Elliott, who, when she was oh. Alice Rasmussen, this was, was a, a, something that we came up with back when we used to talk about writing all the time. And Ooh. this actually came we from We love her. you, Alice. We love you, Alice. Um, we love you, Kate. We, um, we've pimped her before. We pimped her and her omniscient breasts. Okay. Best essay ever on the topic of... Male gaze. The male gaze. I will read it. Um, so the a character's tower is all of their assets, all of their abilities, their plans, their um, ideas, all of their powers. Okay. So when you write a character that has that kind of powers, you then have to look at how high that tower is. And you have to dig them a well that is exactly as deep as it is high. If you have a character that is a tower and no well, you have Superman, who is boring. If you have a character who is all well and no tower, then you have some character who is just like, oh, oh, poor me, 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 who's not fun. But if you balance the tower and the well, then you have an interesting character. And then if you build a really high tower and dig a really deep well, you have got a character that is as amazing as Cyrano de Bergerac, who is what the swordsman conscious poet of, of France, who also has this huge disfiguring thing where he cannot figure out he believes that he can, cannot love. Which cripples his self-esteem, but yeah. not his ego, yeah. nor his wit. Although I feel really bad for the woman in that play. Oh my god. Anyway. Yes. Well, she comes into her own. She does go and find him in the in the um, when they're when they're besieged. She does you know take action herself. Of course, sitting in the convent grieving when Cerno won't tell her. That's. That shit yeah, yeah, it's it's the slapping him. at the end of the play movie that we want to do the most. So yeah. <laughs> good old Rostand. Come on, give her some more agency than that. She could well, I could never it, love again is always such a eh, Yeah. Only to always write that. It was the nineteenth century. It's true. Um, so how do you if you were had said you'd written this amazing novel and it's out there, 
If you wanted to turn it into a play, how would you begin? Well, first of all, it has spaceships, so that's a problem. Okay, if you wanted I mean, to it turn begins, it into a movie, it begins with my, movie. My, my, it's my, in <laughs> space. <laughs> okay, sorry. Well, it begins with a with a person on a courier mission who has decided that she's figured out mathematically how to jump the gates, and that's going to make her a genius. She's going to prove that she's the genius that she is. So she starts out uh, in a personal spacecraft. Uh, flying through the inner system of the dual space stations. So, uh, not a play. I, I would watch Obviously that Obviously not a play. Yeah. <laughs> but could be a movie. Um, she ends up on a, a, a planet uh, where, which is which is still in the Iron Age. Right. Uh, where, anyway. I, um, yeah, no, I don't know. It's because okay, because but, of how Star Wars opened, we got the idea of a space chase can be a perfectly fine way to open a movie. So I can see that, but yeah, I, I see your point on a play. So, what is it? it could be done, but it's very avant-garde. But the question here isn't your book. The question is in general. And you've said this one's too hard to stage. So let's take a different story. And how would you start besides telling us that there's 10 jumps? Let's say you said to yourself, here's a, a book and I really liked it. And I don't know, sisterhood, traveling pants, whatever. A, a play is... A, a play is made, a good play is made of good scenes. Right. So what you look for are the good scenes. The reason why Shakespeare is still performed today is not because he was a great poet, but because the actors who, who, who performed those plays, who were the ones who saved his work for posterity by, by making the first folio, the reason they did that was because of the balcony scene, because of the, the, the duel with... Mercutio, yeah, and yeah. the duel because with the, the, where Isabella sits there and tells Claudio that he has to die because she won't sleep with Angelo. I mean, it's because of the scenes. It is scene work that makes great plays. So what you look for is those people-on-people -people scenes which, between the beginning and the end, take them to a new place. What a play is, is a crucible where you affect, you take your characters and you affect them with extra powerful tensions and, and um, chemistry, whereby over the course of the story they are changed. And you look for stories where you can do that through scene work, not through outside agencies, which are unsatisfying, right. the ex external plot points, which are unsatisfying, but internal plot points where characters and events on stage act upon one another, whereby the characters are changed at the end. So playwright is alchemy. Playwriting yes. as alchemy. Absolutely. Um, internally, uh, although you will have exterior pressures, it's how they adapt and make them their own and transmit them. Well, once you put, I mean, you begin, of course, with an external pressure. The playwright sets the time and the place and the situation. Yeah. But once you do that, it needs to it needs to run itself. If you're always, you know, throwing things out from the back. Oh, the storm is coming. <laughs> now the river is rising. Oh, now the river's gone down. Oh, the child is sick. Oh, he's better now. It's like no, his his fever is worse now. It's better. That's external. That's external okay. plot points, and right. those are not satisfying. Not as much as um, here. I'll throw this medicine down you and see if this you know internal plot points work better. They're more satisfying. The I will sacrifice two pigeons and burn them, and the smoke magically caused something to happen. But I need to see that's happening over here. The king died be because cool the queen there. died. Instead yeah. of the king drops out of the sky and says, "There, you're better." Yes. That's how, how magic can work in a play, too, then, I suppose. Yes, the king died the because he killed the queen up the tension. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then it brings an interesting, I, I don't know, this is going to be pure conjecture here, but take a really thick novel that we've all enjoyed, like Dune. I don't think there can be a Dune movie. I think it almost has to be a miniseries for how many excellent scenes there are. Well, a, a, <laughs> no, a, a, a movie translates about to a novella. Which is why people are, who love a book are always dissatisfied with the movie, because the movie has to leave out about at least half, if not two thirds of it, yeah. in order to, in order to actually function. So yeah, these long you know movie series are, work a lot better. But um, well, they did it with Dexter, Darkly Dreaming Dexter. It's a, a book, and the first of the series is based. I mean, the first of his series of books about Dexter is the first season of the television show. And and you're right, it was about one chapter is an episode, and another chapter is an episode. To, to invert that argument, there are some playwrights, showrunners, screenwrites who, who can do justice. I'm going to specifically call out Neil Gaiman and Stardust and Good Omens. And well, Good Omens was a series, but Stardust was made into a movie and it worked, even though it was a long book. Well, not a long book, but it was a book. Right, but this goes back to the point, you're right. It is a series of scenes, and you have to select which set of scenes. And the difference between Stardust as the book 
and Star does this in the movies, the book is a lot more Byzantine because he has more scenes that he can set things churning in. Yeah. The movie is more visual, which is an advantage, and more direct, and a slightly different character focus because you can have the obviously the actors bring a physicality as you've mentioned that you can't have in the book without a lot of expli explication so we've looked in our novel we've pulled out the scenes what would you do next oh uh, you look for the arc you look for the beginning place you look for the fulcrum because um halfway through plus a page or two of the play is when it all needs to turn on its head. And usually that's the first act break, where everything turns upside down and you end up in a new place. Pulling Shakespeare into it again, if you go to any Shakespeare no. play, <laughs> and you go to take, it, take the page numbers, go to the half page page and look a page or two ahead, you'll find the fulcrum there. You'll find Richard climbing down from his tower. You'll find Hamlet deciding not to kill Claudius. You'll find Catherine getting married. Everybody thinks, you know, the Taming of the True, the halfway point is when they get married. Then the same thing happens. You know, everything else is lead up. There, people forget that. Um, but yeah, there's a fulcrum. So you look for the fulcrum, and then you look for the ending. And you cannot. The, the thing about being a playwright as, as opposed to being a novelist is novelists novelists can get away with, okay, I stopped. <laughs> and okay. I, can I call out um, Sharon Lee and and Steve Miller for that? Yeah. I mean, honest yeah. to. If they were playwrights, the people listening to their... I mean, the first time you finish a play, you have a reading, they would people would scream at them for the way they just... Okay, I stop now. You can't do that. Anyway, so you set up a bunch of stuff so that your ending is bigger than anything else in the play, and everything is fundamentally changed afterwards. If you can... You, you have to change the main character. If you can change all the other characters, too, then you're doing really well. And then if you're really good, at that point, the plot also cracks... And you see how that moment is a metaphor for life, the universe, and everything. Where you actually get a profound view of life. If you do it right, it, you, it can be done. So, can't always do it, but if you can, that's the ultimate. I was also thinking of the Tom Stoppard moment where he says, when everyone who is marked for death dies, that's, that's the, you know, how do you use all the guns on Chekhov's mantelpiece? You have to, if you set it up, you have to knock it down the same way... Yeah, you have the yeah. What you set up, you have to pay off. There's a because otherwise, you do not satisfy your audience. I can um, see that having setups that are not paid off lead to satisfaction. And what you want is eminent satisfaction in your audience. Would you ever consider adapting A Thousandth Night into a novel? Would it would it novelize? No, but I have made it into a movie. I have got a screenplay for it. Okay. So oh. and it got oh, I'm more dying to see the difference of the two. If well, what I was them. what I was able to do is bring in all of occupied France in the play. Um, in the play, all of occupied France is evoked in about two thousand words. Right. And and when it went to France, there were there were people in the audience who were there during the occupation. Right. And the best review that we got in all the audience reviews was, I was there, and I was there. Which means I didn't get anything Aww. wrong. So I got, I got it right. I mean, Yay. people walking out of the theater with their faces white because I got it right. But in the movie, I have the opportunity to put Occupied France into the story. Visually, visually, visually into the story. You know, Does what, it change the length to turn it from you know, play into movie or vice versa? The movie's a little bit longer. Okay. But, I mean, the movie is 120 pages long. Well, last I looked, 110 to 120 mm -hmm. pages long. Though that's becoming more fluid now that there are so many independent movies companies. Mm -hmm. But um, before, if you sent a screenplay in, the first thing they do is look on the last page and see if you came in between 110 and 120. And if you didn't, you obviously didn't know what you were doing, and they closed it and sent it back. That makes sense. All right, we're going to put links to all of these interesting things on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. So the playwriting book is called Playwriting the Merciless Craft. Oh, we're going to put it in there. I've already got it because I purchased it and pimped it out already. So Comprehensive we're... techniques for mastering beginning, intermediate, and advanced playwriting. Exactly. There are beginning playwriting books out there. There aren't a lot of advanced ones. So, Yep. And uh, we answer emails, so I will say I'm going to get Carol hooked up on Facebook. So if you have any uh, questions after this, if you want to reach out, we will we will hook you up and see if we can get some basic answers. It might be join her class, and I noticed you have some classes coming up. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow. 
And our exit music is Breakfast with the Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Jackal Designs, enabling you all to buy cool WDC swag. Thank you.